Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webcast, Achieving Accounts Payable Optimization, Change Management, the Secret Ingredient. We're very excited to have everyone on board this morning or this afternoon, and we appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us. My name is Anne-Marie Cochia, Director of Marketing, Account and Business Process Services, and I'll be moderating for today's webcast. Before we get started, I do have a few quick housekeeping notes. To eliminate background noise, all participants have been muted. You will only be able to hear our presenters speak. If you'd like to ask us a question, you may do so at any time by clicking the Q&A button in the WebEx dashboard on the right of your screen. Type your question and click send, and we'll try to address your question before the end of the webcast. Because we only have limited time, we do apologize in advance if we are unable to answer or address your question online, but we'll be sure to follow up on, un on any unanswered questions after the program. Lastly, we will be sharing an archived version of today's program as well as the deck with all of you after the session is complete. So let's get started, and here's our agenda. Today we're going to be talking about Accounts Payable Optimization, the case for change. Change management, what is it? Why do we need it? Change management in an AP organization and transformation. We're going to provide a case study and then give you some key takeaways. Now, I really don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this, but we do find at the beginning we do want to tell you a little bit about who we are. For those of you not familiar with Canon Business Process Services, we are a business unit of Canon USA. Our services include business process outsourcing, such as accounts payable services, processes such as student financial aid, claims processing, and other paper intensive workflows. We manage document back office processing, such as imaging records and mail. We provide office support services, such as reception, hospitality, and AV. We have e-discovery services from consulting all the way to technology and actually managing the project. We also provide facilities management services and services such as campus logistics and materials management. Over the past nine years, we've been recognized as one of the top 100 global outsourcing providers in the outsourcing industry. Without further ado, I would like to introduce you to, to our esteemed panelists for today. Kathy Bozar has over 20 years of experience in operational accounting and finance, organizational change management, and consulting. She has a great deal of experience driving business process efficiency and organizational transformation. Here at Canon, Kathy creates customized solutions that combine people, process, and technology to enable clients to achieve their vision for accounts payable. Kathy, we're so glad to have you on board today, and we thank you for carving out this time to share your expertise. Thanks, Anne-Marie, and thanks again to all of you for taking the time to join us today. So today we're going to talk about the need to change in accounts payable functions and to address the challenges that exist in many organizations today. We're also going to talk about a topic related to this that's often overlooked and it's critical to the success of transporting accounts payable, and that's change management. So back in 2014, Cat and Business Process Services partnered with IOFM to conduct a study to look at some of the challenges and pain points that organizations are facing today. You can see from the list here, there's quite a few pain points. 83% of invoices are still arriving in paper, paper equivalent format. Four out of five organizations process over half of their invoices manually, and straight through processing is really limited. There are other pain points such as invoice receipt date entry, approval routing, matching. In addition to these, there's a desire out there to improve cash flow management, have better visibility into the AP life cycle, and to really transition accounts payable from an administrative function in the organization to something of a more collaborative and strategic partner. All of these will influence an organization's decision to say, yes, I want to initiate an AP change initiative. 
we at Canon offer a solution to address some of these challenges. And I want to take a minute to walk through our steps to accounts payable optimization, as what I'm going to do later in, the, in our talk today is show you how, with steps like this, how you can apply the change management and theory and tools that I'm going to share with you to each of these transition points in an optimization initiative. Let's start with a worst case scenario, which is our pink box. Everything's manual. We have manual invoice processing, manual approval process, manual reporting, basically no visibility. These are the scenarios where your invoice visibility is calling someone and asking, where is it buried on your desk? So the result of that is, I'm just going to highlight two metrics. Cyclopine, I've seen greater than 30 days. Cost per invoice can be greater than 30, and I've actually seen it as high as $52 per invoice. So Canon recommends that we take a first step in our solution, a simple step from an implementation standpoint, but it might be a challenge from a change management standpoint, as we'll talk about later. With this simple step to simply centralize the invoice receipt, digitize those invoices, apply some OCR technology and extract data, and conduct pre-process validation and GL coding, you can cut your cycle time in half and your cost of invoice nearly in half, just by taking that one step. Then to introduce more automation and more optimization into the process, take a look at introducing workflow for approvals and exception handling. The integration points that we have with ERP and being able to leverage some of the business rules that exist there. You might want to consider use of a global shared services model, something to optimize the labor to go along with the optimized processes and automation. And finally, automated reporting and dashboards. At this point, you further reduce your cycle time. Cost per invoice is cut to a third of what it was when we started looking at manual processing. Some organizations may choose to stop here, but we recommend that you look at continuous improvements. Go beyond just automating the process as it is today. Go beyond adding process improvement to go along with that technology and really look at ways that you can add value to the organization as a whole, to the whole enterprise, and to some of your outside customers as well, such as your suppliers. The one way to do this is to have a vendor portal. That provides supplier self-service, 24-7 access to it, the opportunity for electronic invoicing, PO flip, providing advanced metrics and analytics, not only important to accounts payable, but that's important to other people in your organization, such as procurement for spend analytics, finance, treasury, as it relates to cash. And very important, you now have end-to-end -end process visibility. Although the jump in or the jump in benefits in terms of cost per invoice declining from stage to stage isn't as dramatic as you see it in some of the earlier stages, it really does get you to become a world-class AP organization. Next, I'd like to have us take a closer looker look at change itself. So we just talked about the fact that there are challenges out there in AP organizations today, and we know that there are solutions to reduce or eliminate those challenges. In order to do this, an organization needs to change. So what is change? Change is a process of moving from a current state to a desired future state for a disruptive movement through transition. You'll notice that I highlighted the word disruptive. It's really important to understand that change by its very nature is disruptive. You have to expect it. Disruption in productivity, disruption in work processes, it's going to happen when we make a change. So you might ask yourself, if there's so much risk in making changes, why would we make a change? Bottom line is that the risk of not changing is greater than the risk associated with changing, and we have tools like change management to help us move through a positive change in our organization. So I'm sure that many of you know or heard of Jack Welsh, who was chairman of GE back in 1981 through, I think, 2001. Um, he's known for his aggressive approach to change, and he once said, change before you have to. Basically, recognize that change is something that's positive. It's not a threat. It's an opportunity. He initiated changes that he needed to make to make GE more flexible and competitive. 
we may change part of GE's shared value. So what are some reasons that a finance organization in your company might want to change? Well, similar to GE, high performance finance has to constantly change to be fast and flexible. Have to keep up with the competition and finance is a key part of that. Some organizations may want to become more agile, optimize and make more efficient your financial processes. This includes accounts payable, but can also extend to accounts receivable, fixed assets, and other areas. Meeting internal and external customer demands. Your vendor keeps calling and saying you're paying my bills late. You need to make some changes to change that activity and change the behavior. Finally, to enable growth of the enterprise and employees. A lot of companies that are going to grow, they may grow organically, they may grow inorganically. Um, either way, they are looking at ways that they can continue to grow, which in turn, say in an account payable organization, may increase the volume of invoices, but yet maintain the same staffing le levels and costs. These are other reasons to introduce process efficiency and automation. Finally, don't lose sight of the fact that it also helps growth of employees. Employees who are doing tactical work day after day can become stale, stagnant, and they may desire more. By taking some of the automation and attributing that to technology rather than having folks do this repetitive work, you're able to give them an opportunity to grow as an employee and look at other ways where they can become more analytical or do some more interesting work. As we talk about people, let's look at how change affects people. Change affects everyone. I think we can all agree that change is here to stay. With business, competition, and of course, ever-changing technology, our world is changing more rapidly than ever. So we're going to have to know that change is here and we're going to have to continually keep up with it. How successful organizations are is really dependent on how we manage that change and how we enable our employees to adapt to those changes. Whether it's our personal life or our business life, change has an emotional element to it. In business, we don't always like to acknowledge that. But understanding those emotions is really critical to developing robust change management strategies and ensure that any initiative that we have is successful. I just want to highlight a few points on the slide. Organizational change causes anxiety and frustration. So that's a fact. It's natural as human beings to resist change. And every person is going to react and respond and adjust to that change differently. So there are a lot of models out there that can help us to manage those, those changes that people go through, manage the emotions, manage the reactions. Um, one of them that I like to use is the change cycle model shown here. And the change cycle model has six stages that individuals can fall into during the change process. They don't necessarily mean that they're sequ sequential. Not everyone comes in at loss and moves to doubt or discomfort or discovery, but it's just to recognize that there are these various stages and there are behaviors associated with that. The one area that I'd like to focus on is the danger zone. And it's really tricky in here. This is an area where people have kind of come on board, they're not so doubtful anymore, but there's still a lot of anxiety around making a change. They're asking questions about what's it going to do to my job? Am I going to have a job? Things of that sort. And that's really the danger zone where you can lose people and they can revert back into some of the earlier stages and really infiltrate negativity throughout the organization. So you really want to be careful and target your change management strategy in, with people who are in that area. If you can move them out of that stage and into the next stage, they become your change advocates. So a really important place to focus on. By understanding where people are and what their behaviors are, you're able to tailor and customize your specific communications and training activities to individuals who are showing these behaviors. So this leads us to talk about developing people and guiding them through this change. By doing, we're going to do that by developing a change management strategy. So I want to start by talking about the fact that change is a process and not an event. And this is a key point that I hope that all of you will take with you after the, the webcast today. An event ends. 
as we talked about, change really doesn't end, and it's a process. It's a continuing, continuously changing evolution in and of itself. So the strategy is a way to align the organization's people and culture with the changes that are going on in business strategy, processes, and technology. It's a process, as I said, of changing in a structured and thoughtful way, considering organizational goals, your mission, your objective, and your culture. And finally, it's a set of tools and techniques enabling the management of the people side of initiative from a very tactical level. So I think we all agree that change, that change requires us to be very tactical and have a practical approach. So we can have theory and all of that is nice, but we really have to get down to the nuts and bolts of how we're going to person by person, group by per group, prepare an organization for change. So this is a practical approach that I developed for an organization that was going through an account payable transformation. And I group my strategy into four main areas, and although each of these pieces of this pie here, stakeholder management, training, ongoing support, organizational alignment, are individual, they also interact with each other very much. And of course, communication is at the center of all of it. What I mean by that interaction is, let's say that our stakeholder assessment, we do that multiple times during the course of our transition. and People change, roles change, people's views change based on training activities or communication activities that we've conducted. Someone who is resistant may no longer be resistant. So with that, we have to continuously take the pulse of what's going on in our organization and readjust either our training or communication, organizational alignment to react to that change in their behavior. So I'm going to talk about each one of these pieces individually. Stakeholder management, this is really the foundation. I've chosen four different groups or categories to distinguish my stakeholders. Those four are governance, users, influencers, and providers. Now you might find that there are other categories that are more relevant for you. For example, executive management, or indirect change targets versus direct change targets, external customers. Make it real to your organization and relevant to your organization. In this instance, governance is really talking about people like PMOs, steering committees, executive sponsors. These are people who are really going to be interested in how things are managed on the project. They're going to be interested in communication tools and vehicles and methods such as status reports. They want to know what kind of controls you have in place. They're interested in timelines. They're really interested in risks and what your mitigation plans are around those risks. Some other people who might fall into this category are your internal or external auditors or regulators, depending on your industry. Users, these are your direct change targets. These are the folks who are going to be touching, feeling, using the system. Everything that you design in terms of process and or technology, these are the people who have to execute on a day-to-day -day basis. So most of your training and communication is really going to be targeted at this group. Next, we have influencers. Influencers can be as broad as a union, someone who can change the course of your project. It's really how I define an influencer. A real life example of an influencer internally might be you're trying to sell the business case to your decision maker in an organization you know that you need to optimize accounts payable. And your CFO just isn't convinced that the business case you're providing is the way to go and that he wants to make the investment. But you find out that this individual, and this is a real life example, plays golf with the procurement manager on Friday in the summer. And you might want to talk to that procurement manager about some of the benefits and have him talk to the CFO because sometimes indirect influence can get us a little bit further than direct influence. So that's one way and one reason that you should really look at people who have influence and may not be directly impacted by the project. Next are providers. As you would expect, this is where vendors fall in and suppliers. Um, and you might have targeted communication to folks like this. 
So if you have a change in imaging, for example, and now you're going to have imaging and centralization of invoices and applying all the technology that goes along with that, you may want to communicate to your vendor that you need an invoice to be in a very specific format now. Um, by having automation involved in PO matching, you might want to contact folks and let them know that either A, you need to have the PO number on the invoice or there needs to be some other um, tag to be able to match these. I want to talk and move over to um, training. Training is pretty self-explanatory. There's only one area that I want to highlight that I believe gets overlooked, and that's the project team. A lot of focus and attention that gets placed on training our end users. But the initial change catalyst and change agent on a project comes from the project team. Make sure your project team has the skills that they need not only to execute their role in configuration or process design or whatever it might be as part of the project, but also that they understand how to be a change agent because they're really your front line. Next, ongoing support. Why is this important? Well, it's important to make sure people can execute, of course, but it's important to handle that emotional side of, of people as well. People need that security. They need to know that through every part of this transition, including after a go live, if we'd like to call it that, they have a place to go for resources. They have support. They're going through this change, but they're not going through it alone. So this can come in the form of, say, a help desk or something like that, but it's also important for them to have user groups and a lead user community because sometimes folks feel more comfortable taking that direction from people who are going through what they're going through. So rather than a help desk or people who were on the project team, a peer-to-peer -peer exchange can be really beneficial. Finally, we'll talk about organizational alignment. It's great for people to know their job roles and how they're changing. It's equally important to make sure that there's formal updates to job descriptions and the introduction of KPIs and goals associated with the project into individual PMPs. This is a great motivator. Also, consideration of outsourcing as an organizational decision comes into play in this area. And this might give a company um, the ability and enable them to use their current resources, um, reallocate them to another area that might have a different value to them in terms of their core business. So communication, highlighted here in the middle, is so critical, critical that I've given it its own slide. As I said before, it's the core of change management and the core of the change management strategy. It's really critical that you understand your stakeholders the stage they are in the chain cycle or something similar to that, and what their training needs are. And then have a targeted strategy based on that with communication tools and frequency involved that you can plan and execute based on those elements. Really important to tie the frequency and the messaging and the tools to the needs and the emotional place that folks are in. I can't overstate the importance enough of a robust detailed communication plan. Although you have a plan, this is one plan that has to be very fluid. This goes back to where people might move back and forth in the change cycle. They may change from resistors to acceptors. Um, there's a lot of reasons that you need to keep this fluid. There might be changes in the design and you have to re-communicate. So keep in mind any key elements of effective communication. Please keep in mind these effective communication tips. Most of us are aware of the seven Cs. Clear, concise, concrete, correct, coherent, complete, courteous. And we all learn those at some point in our lives. I prefer a more concise version and have used this for various AP transformation initiatives. First is comprehensive. Be short, concise, and understandable to your audience. Really target the audience. Be credible. To create impact, you need credibility. This can be by including facts in the message or in who delivers the message. Let me expand on that. If you have a great set of facts and communicate those facts to your audience, but it's communicated by someone who does not have credibility in the organization, then you've just sabotaged the effectiveness of that message. 
So make sure that you have the right people delivering the message. Don't overlook that. Next, form a connection with your audience in order to gain a, like an emotional response, some response at all from them would be great. Um, relevance of the message is important to executing this. So let's say that you have a group of AP analysts and processors in a room and you start talking about the benefits of cash flow, um, cash flow benefits when it comes to an AP optimization, they're not really going to respond. But if you're sitting face to face with your CFO, he is going to be really interested in the message that you're conveying. Contagious. Deliver the message in a way that makes people want to share the message. There's no better way to promote a positive response and a positive reaction to the changes going on than to have people walk out of a room where you've just given a town hall or a lunch and learn and go back to their desks and talk to their peers in a very positive way about that. So get them excited, um, build support in your organization. As with everything, there are risks. So what are the risks of not being effective in your communication? Well, you're going to have mixed messages, confusion, negativity, a lack of acceptance, and maybe most hurtful, a lack of trust from your executive management team. If you're not effective with your communication with them, it could impact the current project or it can impact approval for future projects and future optimization. I want to leave you with this quote on this slide from George Bernard Shaw. He once said, the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. You can have the best newsletters, posters, lunch and learn, training, anything. And if people didn't understand, if people didn't get the message, then you really haven't communicated. You just think you have. So it's very important to listen to people, to read nonverbal cues from people, and to formally get feedback via questionnaires, change assessments, things of that sort. So don't be shaken by the illusion that communication has taken place. Really document and understand that it has, confirm that it has. So by now I think that we've covered enough to say that it's become clear to why we need to change management, why we need a strategy around it to ensure that AP transformation initiatives um, can be successful. I've highlighted a few more here. The most important points I want to share with you is that you need to build commitment. And to do that, you really have to prepare people for the change. And if you can do that, you're going to deliver real improvement. What happens if you don't have a change management strategy? Well, I can read all of these, but the bottom line is it increased costs because you're not going to have people engaged, you're going to have conflict, you're going to slow down the process, and really, if you've invested $140 million into an ERP implementation, let's say, and people don't know how to use it and they don't want to use it, you've just wasted $140 million. Keep in mind, change itself doesn't achieve business results. People produce results. Technology alone does not. We talked a lot about some of the theory why you need a change management strategy, what that might look like. There's a tactical side as well. That's where change management tools come into play, and I've placed a lot of these here on the screen. So here's a list of tools that can really help you create a targeted change management plan. Stakeholder assessments, posters, communication plans, lunch and learns, your training courses, change dashboards. So keep people informed, that's really important, and be creative. The key is to select the right tool at the right time for the right people. So now that we talked about some of the key elements of change management itself, we're curious to know the emphasis that your organization places on change management. We ask that you take a few minutes to answer our poll question. Well, thank you, Kathy. And uh, we have a question here for our audience, and we hope that you just take a moment and record your answer on the right. Does your company or organization place a focus on change management activities during transitions involving process or technology? Please take a moment and uh, provide us with your, with your responses. I see they're tallying up right now. Uh, 
So Kathy, I see that we, we still have some coming through, so let's just wait a moment or two. So it's almost a 50-50 split. We're seeing 52% are saying that they do, in fact, um, place an emphasis on change management activities. What do you think about that, Kathy? I think that that's great. Um, it's a change. It in and of itself is a change. Um, a lot of companies don't place an emphasis on that. The fact that it's 50-50 shows improvement in where we've been in the past, but that also tells me that we have a long way to go. I would like to see that number being at 75 or 80 percent. I'm also glad to see that people have an opinion and that there's not too many people who aren't sure about that. That tells us that, you know, you're really on the pulse of what your company, um, your company's beliefs are around change management and the investment that they're willing to make in it. So let's look at a few examples of how change management tools and theory, as we talked about, can be applied to an AP optimization initiative, such as the one described earlier. Before I do that, I want to just take a moment to kind of set the stage for this. So although this is a cartoon, I think the message is re very real. We just looked at some of the reasons an organization chooses to change their AP function and a canon solution to enable that AP optimization. The majority of decision makers are very comfortable making decisions around process changes, automation, and maybe even changes to their staffing model. They'll ask their employees and their stakeholders to come on over here. We want you to do these, use these new systems and processes. However, many organizations and providers of these services don't always tell you how. So the application of a robust change management strategy and execution of the detailed task at a tactical level can be the bridge to cross that gap. It's really what change management is, and that is the secret ingredient for success. In the next few slides, I'm going to talk you through the application of the change management theory that I shared and apply that to the CBPS steps of AP optimization that I presented earlier. So just as a refresher, this is what the, the full AP optimization model looks like. And we're going to take a, step, a look first at an example of what might happen in those first stages when you're proving the case for change. So I want to start by saying that these next few slides, they really provide examples of the challenges that you may face and some tools that you can apply. This is not meant to be exhaustive, but just kind of to walk you through a process that you might look at um, in your own transitions. And this is going to vary organization to organization. So I want to start with this scenario, which is proving the case for change. You're a manual organization, and you make the decision to centralize and digitize. So this scenario presents some of the biggest risks, but some of the biggest rewards. It's the point in which you can make a case for change. That's the example I'm going to use here. So what are some of the challenges and opportunities that we have? Well, building that business case. The challenge is you want to secure budget and resources. And this is really important is a lot of organizations at this point, a lot that I've worked with, have a perceived notion of letting go of control. And I say perceived notion of letting control because once they understand the value, they'll realize they actually have more control. So by using change management tools such as benchmarking, presentation of facts that demonstrate a shift to automation can really remedy pain points for people and add value, these are ways that you can gain trust and eventually obtain executive sponsorship. That trust will help to address the concerns that people might have around making these changes, whether it be having centralized invoice receipt by an internal group or an external group. Being mindful of the emotion attached to things like letting go is really important in how you position and how you communicate. What's the risk of not having a strategy around this? Doubt, questions, and most importantly, you might end up with the status quo by not having the project approved. So let's say we were very successful, we've obtained sponsorship, and we've centralized and digitized. Now we're ready to go back to our sponsors and say, we'd really like to take the next step. 
we want to move into a more automated model, and we want to optimize our labor organization to go along with that. Although some of the points that I shared with you in the previous slide are still relevant, I just want to highlight something new that would come up in this area. The focus in this transition is the end user, the person who will be expected to execute these new processes every day. In addition to being aware of the level of resistance to change, it's really important to think about the training aspects of change strategy at this point in time as well. So some of the challenges you might have are concerns about risk and control again, but now from a more personal and more tactical level. Staff concerns about job security, which has emotion tied to it. Concerns about their own ability to perform. Are they up to the task? Will they have the right training? Will they have the right support? This is where you have to get people comfortable. Do assessment. Get people engaged. This is a great opportunity to invite people to be part of the solution. Ask them to be lead users. Ask them to be testers. Get the right people engaged in the design process. If you can make people part of the solution, they won't be a problem. Um, what are the risks of not having a strategy around this? Decline in productivity can be exaggerated from what the standard expectation would be, and there might be staff exits. So some of these things are inevitable. The important thing is that you want to be prepared for them and have an action plan to address them. Kathy, I see that we do have a write-in question. Uh, if we could just take a moment, uh, let's see. Um, in your experience, who usually leads the change process when AP departments are looking to implement AP improvements? That's a great question. Um, I want to say that it depends. So it depends on what the structure of the project is and where it resides. At a very high level, the change management function and sponsorship can come from a few places. Um, it can come from IT, depending if that's where the project rolls up, come from finance. From a tactical perspective, it can come from your project management team. And in some cases, you could have a designee from your own organization lead the change management effort as a business owner or a process owner on the project and have them partner with your internal communications and training team to execute a really great strategy. Okay, well, thank you. Them, I've seen all of them. All of them work. The most successful has fallen under finance, um, having an internal leader versus a consultant, per se, um, as a team, um, really engaging people um, from a tactical level. So the framework is a little bit hard for people internally to put together. Um, the value that the internal team members have is really on that peer-to-peer -peer trust relationship piece. Okay. So now we're going to make an assumption that We've centralized and digitized. We've introduced automation for workflow and approvals and exception handling and all those great things. And we want to take our organization to the next level. So we want to enhance our vendor relationship. Um, we really want to get the engagement of stakeholders outside of AP, such as treasury or procurement. And one of the challenges might be complacency. People might start getting a little too comfortable and may not get interested in continuous improvement. Some of the key tools we can use here are in, you know, to demonstrate all of the advancements that we've made in these other stages through facts, fact reporting on improvements, KPIs, the benefits that have been achieved by making the other changes. And that really is the best case for future change, the success of the changes we've made today. Having demos for things like a vendor portal, mobile applications, um, letting people see the tools themselves can be really valuable. And what are the risks? Changes aren't integrated into the operations because people become complacent. If you don't continue to change, people may think, well, we did this and now we're finished. So now that we're finished with this exercise, we can just revert back to the way we did things before. So you don't want to lose all the progress that you made along the way. And of course, you would not realize optimal results. So you're leaving money and unrealized optimization in the full P2P process on the table because some of these things might be perceived as nice to have instead of value added.
So as you think about an AP change initiative that your own organization is considering or going through now, give some thought to what you think the biggest change management hurdle you would expect is. So once again, we'd like to hear from our audience here today. And the question we have for you is, what is the biggest change management challenge that you expect in transforming your AP function? Please uh, take a moment and log your answer on the right of your screen. Okay, we have some coming in here. We'll just take a moment or two more. We have a great response. A few more seconds. Okay, a minute or two, second or two. All right, so Kathy, what we're seeing here is B, change target end user resistance. So are you surprised by that? No, and especially not given the fact that people said that there was, in the previous poll, that there was support for change management activity. So that would rule out things like executive sponsorship and the budget, because I would expect that you would get that if people are, are interested. Um, the change target and end user resistance, I think that just comes back down to what we talked about earlier, is it's human nature to resist change, and it just demonstrates more the importance of making sure that you have a strategy in place to address the risk associated with that. So I want to share with all of you a case study from a former project that I worked on. And I'm just going to say, assume that the company was a consumer goods company. They were implementing a new technology and processes associated with that and organizational alignment, and it included accounts payable. Um, some of the facts around this, I want to stress this, the technology, the process, the organizational changes were equal in a two-phase rollout. The only difference was which business groups were going first. In the first phase, they were doing a lot of development and configuration, and there were some budget overruns. So a decision was made at a higher level to cut change management, everything. There was still going to be training, but everything else associated with change management was being cut. The result, as you might expect, was not good. There was significant resistance, a lack of adoption by the end users, which there was rework, there was postal life configuration changes because you didn't have the right people engaged in the design, in the user acceptance testing, so it wasn't until people went live that they found things that weren't configured properly. There was retraining, and the irony is change management was cut to offset budget overruns and resulted in costs that even exceeded those overruns. So it really didn't help. So a group of us went to our CIO with a business case and said, we can't do this again and be successful in phase two. So we were successful in getting a full organizational change team. We established KPIs. We had them incorporated into folks' PMPs. We had great training. We had wonderful communication. We had managers of each of those um, areas. And the result was on time and under budget, a great lead user community that facilitated user adoption. So the reason I share this is that Absolutely everything was equal in phase one and phase two, and the difference between success and failure was change management. So I just want to take a few minutes of your time to highlight Canon's ability to facilitate change. As we talked about, we provide an end-to-end -end solution. You can see some of the tasks associated with these in centralized, digitized, automate labor optimization, continuous improvement phases. We also provide administrative and accounting support, like help desk services, GL bank reconciliation, P card admin, et cetera. I really want to focus on is that when Canon defines an end-to-end -end process, when we say we provide an end-to-end -end solution, we don't stop with AP. End-to-end -end goes into implementation and ongoing support. If you think back to the cartoon, Canon can be the bridge that answers the question of how. Our staff. We have experts in AP best practices, project management, Lean Six Sigma, 
but we really have is passion around ensuring that your organization continues to improve. And we can provide you with a change strategy and plan to help guide you through that transition. With that, I just want to leave you with a few points to take away from the webcast. First and foremost, change is inevitable, but being prepared for change is not. So I challenge all of you to make sure that whenever you're engaging in any sort of process or automation change initiative, make sure you're prepared and be prepared for the unexpected. Transformation is not driven by automation and process alone. A focus on people and change management is critical to success. Focus and address the human side. The menu of change tools is vast. Select those that really meet the appetite of your organization through each phase of transition or transformation. Always consider your corporate culture. Understand your stakeholders at every level. Start at the top and involve every level. Get your executive management out there for roadshows and town halls and things like that. Engage your, your AP analysts and AP coordinators to participate in user acceptance and testing. Have them become lead users. That can really make a difference. I think I've said it a lot. I'm going to say it one more time. Communication cannot be underestimated. Create ownership and accountability. If people are accountable and they feel that they own the process, they're going to deliver on the process. The transition of AP optimization is only as successful as the people executing that transition. And finally, have fun and celebrate your successes. So I want to thank you again for your time. I hope the information shared today is of value to you. And um, we'd now like to open up the conversation for any questions or comments that people might have. Do we have any questions from the audience? Let's see. All right, well, I'm not seeing any questions at this point. Um, that does conclude today's session. And I do also want to thank our audience today for joining us. We hope you did find today's, insightful, uh, today's program insightful and helpful. If you have any additional questions for Kathy or would like to learn more about how Canon Business Process Services is helping other companies do AP transitions and change management, please contact us directly. And we do have Kathy's email on the screen here. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks so very much.